BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Just a couple of quick announcements and reminders before we truly begin. The first is that there will be a new and updated version of Killer on a White Horse, a story of the Evening Watchman, coming soon. Think of it as a second edition. It's going to contain the original novel, as well as the sequel story, Down the Dark Lane, which was my second book, Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel, and that will be released as an updated version. And sometime, hopefully by the end of the year, I'm hoping to release Down the Dark Lane as an audio book here on YouTube for free. So if you'd like to follow along with everything associated with this channel, in addition to Zodiac Monday and Ripper Wednesdays talking about Jack the Ripper, I invite you to hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out the channel. And you can also go through some of the links in the description box. One of them is for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. So recently, there have been a new set of videos that have come out on Planet X Filmworks, which is run by Ross, who does a very great job over there, not only covering the Zodiac Killer, but D.B. Cooper and many, many other types of subjects get covered on Planet X Filmworks. And Ross does some other things with music. He also has a graphic novel or comic book out, and I invite you to go over to his channel, like, and subscribe as well. I'm a subscriber to Planet X Filmworks, and there is a new video out that is a Zodiac Killer debate and discussion with Drew Beeson, author of Citing It on the Zodiac Killer, and Drew Sir. Now, I've talked about releasing some Zodiac Killer debate interviews in the near future, but to be honest with you, I was just focused on the present, living in the moment, the here and now. I was watching this thing on Planet X Filmworks and just thinking, wow, I wish I had been a participant in that. Because I think a lot of you guys are like that in the comments section where you're watching a video or you're listening to a podcast and you're just thinking, I have something to say about that. I, I want to chime in. I want to just give my input on the subject. And that's ultimately why I started Black Box Online Radio. However, I mean, I was watching Drew and Drewser. Um, yeah, both of them are named Drew, by the way. And I will just simply refer, be referring to one of them as Drew, sir, one of his online names throughout the duration of this discussion. And it was a fairly balanced debate, and it felt more like a conversation rather than a debate. But they talked about a lot of differences in comparing and contrasting of the different interpretations of evidence in the Zodiac Killer mystery. Now, to provide some basic introduction for this episode... We're going to be revisiting Don Cheney as a Zodiac Killer suspect. He is Drew Beeson's suspect in the Zodiac Killer mystery. And Don Cheney was the friend of Arthur Lee Allen, who made somewhat of a splash in 2007 when he appeared in the documentary. His name was Arthur Lee Allen, as well as being a source for other things, particularly in one of Grace Smith's books, Zodiac Unmasked, Don Cheney is mentioned very frequently, and he provides a lot of source material. And Drew Beeson was watching the accompanying documentaries to the 2007 Fincher film, This is the Zodiac Speaking, and his name was Arthur Lee Allen. And he caught on to something that a lot of other people thought about, and that was that 
Don Chaney made the statement that he might have licked some of the stamps that were used by Arthur Lee Allen when he was mailing letters. Now, why would somebody say that if they weren't expecting to be found guilty of something? Why would somebody say that if they weren't expecting that their DNA would come back? I mean, that's almost like they're trying to make an excuse in case their DNA would come back. And that could have led to some type of greater suspicion for numerous people. So many people have written that into the comments section here on Black Box Online Radio. And even I thought about it back in 2018, although I didn't identify Don Cheney by name, but I did an episode called Arthur Lee Allen's Partner, where it almost seems like, okay, you have the Zodiac Killer case, an unsolved serial killer mystery, and you want to find out what exactly is the reason why there is this mountain of evidence against Arthur Lee Allen. Well, could it be because he had a partner and that's why some things didn't seem to match. The Zodiac Killer was a serial killer who operated in California in 1968 and 69, maybe committed other crimes. We are uncertain. However, Arthur Lee Allen went on to become the prime suspect in Zodiac Killer mystery, and he had a friend named Don Cheney, whom Drew Beeson went on to suspect of being the Zodiac Killer, and Drew went on to write the book, Citing In on the Zodiac Killer. Now, I've talked to both of these guys before, and Drew Durex has appeared on a lot of forums. He's also been in the comments section on ZodiacCypher.com, which is run by Richard Grinnell, and he doesn't have an exact suspect, but he definitely makes lots of commentary-like statements about the case, which is something that I can completely empathize with, because I do a lot of that here on Black Box Online Radio. And I would like to give my feedback on this debate video, and even if you haven't watched it, even if you haven't watched the debate on Planet X Filmworks, I invite you to do so. I invite you to check it out in the future, but I want this to be available to anyone. You can kind of just jump right in. I always want my episodes to be available to people who haven't read the book that I'm talking about or watched the YouTube video that I'm talking about. Now, I think that you guys want to get right into the moments of criticism, because for something like a debate discussion, you want to know what are people going to be disagreeing with. And I think that my biggest disagreement with Drew Beeson is related to the Zodiac Killer's misspellings, because not only did the Zodiac Killer commit murders, he also mailed in letters and ciphers. And the letters are filled with misspellings, and the solutions to the ciphers are also filled with misspellings. And you can just go through most of the Zodiac letters, and you'll find some type of misspelling in the letters. And Drew has stated that Arthur Lee Allen misspelled words intentionally for comedic effect. The most famous example that he brings up is when Arthur Lee Allen would write out a shopping list, he would spell the word eggs, A-I-G-G-S, like eggs. And I even laughed the first time that I heard that. Arthur Lee Allen was a terrible person, but he made me laugh once. That's something. And it's, he presents it as something that is very bizarre or could not be done frequently, that people don't normally misspell words intentionally for comedic effect. And did the former friend of Arthur Lee Allen, Don Cheney, decide to use that in the creation of the Zodiac Killer persona in some way? The reason why I disagree with this is I've known numerous people who have misspelled words for comedic effect. I don't think it's that weird. I've done it. There's even another Zodiac Killer suspect named Richard Gajkowski, who also misspelled words for comedic effect. And the most famous example of it is when he was filling out a form in the 1980s, and he decided to answer the words with the words yes and yes, yes. And the second time he wrote the word yes, he added two S's at the end of it. It's misspelled for comedic effect. And I'm also going to share something with you guys. Now, I've been tempted to talk about this in the past, but it's either slipped my mind or something similar. And that is that back when I was younger, I was actually in high school. I know it. I had to have been in the 10th grade because this is when I read the book. We had this world history class, and one of the books contained an excerpt from someone from the British Empire who was writing about Hinduism. But every time he wrote out the word Hindu, he would write it H-I-N-D-O-O. -O. Now, that was not done for comedic effect. That was an, um, an alternative spelling that was used. Maybe it was the dumb, and that's the way the guy learned to spell the word. But for some reason, I thought that was silly to spell the word Hindu with two O's, and I created this idea for a comic novel about, well, it was just called A World Without You, and it was about how we're just going to remove the letter U from the English language, 
and everything has to be spelled with double O's, like the bus will become the boos, or maybe even the word you would become Y-O-O-O, you, and then... Of course, I mean, the main character in this novel that I never actually wrote was going to be a drug dealer, but he had to be referred to as a drug dealer. And some of that stuff has already been um, shared in A Clockwork Orange. The name of the uh, thugs and that were the drugs. Drug is actually a uh, Russian word meaning friend. We say on my drug or ya spots on them, meaning like I'm friends with a male, a guy. So, I mean, that's not even the most original idea in the world. But yes, that would be all about misspelling words intentionally for a comedic effect. And it's interesting that I mentioned the Russian language because I also had a second idea for a comic novel. And that was called A World Without Russia. And it's just this um, idea that there would be a type of, um, well, it's kind of just hard to explain, but if the nation Russia didn't exist... And what you see on the map, the biggest country in the world, is just a giant pit that goes to the center of the earth. You know, how would life be different if just there was this enormous hole in the earth? Absolutely not done in a scientific way, but again, just meant to be some type of silly thing that could be expanded upon into a book. A world without Russia, a world without you. I'd rather have a world without serial killers, to be honest. There were some other points in the comments section that people were asking that weren't really relevant to Drew's points or or to um, the points made by Drewser. And that was that, has Donald Lee Cheney been exonerated from being the Zodiac Killer? Has he, his name been cleared? Was he looked into by the authorities? And the answer to that question is, yes, he was looked into by the authorities. And Tom Void of ZodiacKiller.com is very, very loud about this, that he is the person who received a letter from Donald Lee Cheney recognized some similarities in the Zodiac Killer's handwriting, and then got alerted the authorities, and they asked for Don Chaney's handwriting, fingerprints, and uh, DNA. And Don Chaney voluntarily provided all of these. Now, I would like to give a shout-out to YouTube user Jamie Hendrickson, who once said that the Zodiac Killer would never voluntarily give somebody's DNA, give his DNA, excuse me, never voluntarily give a DNA sample because... DNA was not a thing in 1968 and 69 when the Zodiac Killer was operating. Therefore, the Zodiac could never be certain that he had left um, his DNA behind. But somebody like Don Cheney might always have the excuse of, oh, well, I knew Arthur Lee Allen, and he's the one who did it, and he planted my DNA or his DNAs on the stamps. Something to that effect. And I think that that's more or less how... Drew has arranged his theory, and he even talked about this in the debate, that it's always playing the card of he can blame it on Arthur Lee Allen. Arthur Lee Allen might even be the perfect patsy, if you will. That's why he has this type of um, get-out-of-jail-free card. But Allen can't get arrested for everything, because then, firstly, he would get credit for Don Chaney's criminal masterpiece, and secondarily, it would put an end to things. It would almost be like... Don Cheney is not directly trying to get caught. In fact, he's not trying to get caught. He's trying to stay out of jail. And he just wants to um, keep the game moving. It's almost as if it's all a game to him. In some ways, a twisted sick serial killer game. And this relates to another point that was discussed in the debate. Was the Zodiac Killer afraid of getting caught? And, I mean, that's not the way, exactly the way that the challenge questions were formed. But it relates to some activities after the Zodiac Killer's final crime on October 11th of 1969, the murder of Paul Stein. Now, on the one hand, you have the Zodiac Killer acting like some type of very ballsy, borderline brave individual, fearless individual. And he is someone who is just committing these murders and taunting the police. He is inserting himself into the story. He's making phone calls saying... If you go one mile east on the Columbus Parkway, there are two kids who were shot. I'm the one who did it. He's doing all of these things to put himself into the action. And not to mention murdering Paul Stein in somewhat of a populated area where the Zodiac Killer was witnessed by multiple people. Is the Zodiac someone who is safe or is he careless or is he reckless? Is he someone who's afraid of getting caught? 
And this is a point where I will insert my own response. As I said, you know, if I had been participating, the Zodiac Killer was an extremely inconsistent individual. No matter what he was doing, no matter what he's doing, the Zodiac was inconsistent because sometimes he is safe, other times he's careless. Sometimes he is very direct and ballsy. Look at the previously mentioned examples making phone calls to taunt the police about murders that he committed. But other times, like say, for example, wiping down the taxi cab, which mostly I think was done to destroy fingerprints. And I mean, I can give you my own um, personal analysis of what I think happened after the Stein murder. And I'm not some type of perfect forensic detective, but I can tell you what I think happened. It's that the Zodiac Killer shot Paul Stein, a taxi driver, on the side of the head by the right ear, and that Paul Stein's driving this taxi, and it wasn't in park yet, or it would have been a manual taxi, and it has, you know, the gear shift. So what the Zodiac wants to do is he actually wants to grab a hold of Paul Stein's body and move the car over to the side of the road. Then the Zodiac killer would go on to take Paul Stein's wallet, keys, and a piece of his bloody shirt, which had been first cut, it's most likely that some type of incision was made, and then it was torn or ripped up and down, and then it was actually a fairly neat rectangle that was taken out of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. And then, I think that the reason why the Zodiac Killer took the keys was he simply wanted to turn off the taxi, and he didn't want to leave the engine running, and it could have been purely done out of habit. And it could also have been done because he didn't want to draw attention to the taxi even for just a second or two. But I think it might have been the first more likely that he wanted to turn off the car. And it was just a habit because he was a driver himself. So he just took the keys with him. As far as taking the wallet, a lot of people believe that the Zodiac Killer took Paul Stein's wallet because he wanted to make it look like a taxi cab robbery. So when the authorities got on the scene, they wouldn't immediately think that it was the Zodiac Killer. And this is something that was also discussed in the debate. Another question, do you believe that the Zodiac wanted to draw or write a message on Paul Stein's taxi to take credit for the crime? Because prior to the Stein murder, the Zodiac had written a message on the car door at Lake Berryessa, which had the Zodiac symbol and the dates of Zodiac activity. Did he want to do that after the Stein murder? I vote no. And the reason why is because I was also given a similar challenge question once. Do you believe that the Zodiac wanted to make a phone call on October 11th of 1969 after the Stein murder because at Blue Rock Springs and Lake Berryessa there were phone calls that took place? And I shouldn't say at Blue Rock Springs and Lake Berryessa because they took place um, after the crimes. One time it's 40 minutes later and one time it is an hour and 10 minutes later and the Zodiac called to take credit for the murders or what he thought were murders at the time because... By the time he had made the Lake Berryessa phone call, both of the victims were actually still alive, but he thought that they had been murdered. I don't believe that the Zodiac wanted to leave any type of signature on the car door after the Stein murder, and I also don't believe that the Zodiac wanted to make a phone call because he already had Paul Stein's bloody shirt. He had the piece of the bloody shirt, rather, and he had the keys and the wallet, he had the ability to prove that he was going to take credit for the crimes via a letter, so he didn't have to do anything to linger at the crime scene any longer than he had to have done. And I also think that the Zodiac was the type of person who may have been telling the truth about, this, about putting airplane cement on his fingertips. In the past, I thought it was a complete lie. The Zodiac wrote a letter once that, he didn't leave any fingerprints behind because he had been too clever and he had applied two coats of model airplane glue cement on his fingertips. And I was just thinking, that's a lie. Obviously, this guy left fingerprints behind. And he um, just made up the story because he didn't want them to think that it was his. It's like a last-ditch effort. Oh, yeah, those fingerprints that I left behind, well, they're not mine. I mean, that's not going to work. So he's just saying... I put airplane cement on my fingertips. So I'm very 50-50 on that. I think there's a very high likelihood of that. But what I'm even more certain of is that 
The Zodiac probably left a fingerprint somewhere in Paul Stein's taxi. Could it have been the bloody fingerprint that the air are talking about, or is it any type of fingerprint that would have been imprinted in the blood? That one, I think there's a lot less likely of a chance. There's a lower chance that that one is true. But the biggest issue that people seem to have with Don Cheney as a Zodiac killer suspect does indeed relate to the previously mentioned claims about how he was quote-unquote exonerated because his DNA fingerprints and handwriting were all taken by the authorities. And one point that I did not hear very clearly explained in the debate is that, well, yes, they took those samples from him, but is it my understanding that the authorities never made a statement that Don Cheney's DNA did not match? They never made a statement that his handwriting did not match. They never made a statement that his fingerprints didn't match. It's just simply they didn't respond to the public at all, or even respond to Tom Void of ZodiacKiller.com, who got the ball moving with all of that. So, I think that um, that leaves some things open in the air, or definitely it shows to show that there could also be alternative explanations. I mean, what if we are dealing with someone who put airplane cement on their fingertips, some type of modified um, fingerprint that they aren't used to examining? There can be interference, or there can be an inconclusive finding. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone is innocent or guilty. But as somebody who runs a true crime channel here on YouTube, I found that one of the more fascinating parts of the debate related to a discussion about how Don Cheney may have witnessed a composite sketch drawing in the newspaper of a possible murderer and thought that it was Arthur Lee Allen, and they were calling it the Grass Valley Murders, and the composite sketch that was there, and Druzer made this comment that he had looked into the story, but he wasn't sure exactly which story in the Grass Valley Murders it was directly referring to, and I was like, well, now how is that possible? I mean, either it was printed in the paper or not, right? Right? Well, no, wrong. It turns out there's a little bit more to it than I was going through, and I found that there are multiple crimes that are under this possible umbrella term of the Grass Valley Murders. And right now I would like to read an article from The Union that was published in 2004 that is talking about two of the victims in the Grass Valley Murders. I should let you know that there has been a conviction in this case, but could this have some type of influence on the Zodiac Killer mystery? Let's see. It was 20 years ago today that Don Donaldson and Chrissy Campbell were murdered. It had been 18 years since Sam Strange was sentenced to prison for 30 years to life. The last time Sam Strange was mentioned, in a newspaper was six years ago, when the lead investigator in Nevada County Sheriff's Department, named Ron Smith, retired. But Sam Strange and the two 16-year-old girls he was convicted of killing were far from forgotten in Nevada County. Many remember the tragedy, and everyone seems to have an opinion. Since shortly after his arrest in 1994 and up to his parole last August, Sam Strange has consistently pointed the finger at two other men, Alan Pettis and Damon Graham. Sam Strange maintains that he only witnessed the crime and disposed of the girls' bodies out of fear, even though the families are divided in their beliefs. Dawn's mother, Linda Olson, and sister Amber Raymond strongly believe that Strange was the responsible party, but the Campbells are not so sure. Chrissy's father, Doug Campbell, said that he came to believe that Strange's account over time, especially after talking to Strange's mother, Kathy Morales, Kathy Morales, her full name is Kathy Strange Morales, actually, and reading the transcripts that she wrote about his case. Bodies were discovered a week after the girls went missing. It's a whodunit. People didn't know who there was the killer out there. And it also um, goes on for a while talking about some of the details of the case. But there's actually another story that does feature the composite sketch that could possibly be called into question. And it talks about a possible serial killer called the Dog Bar Slayer. And by bar, it's more like Tina Bar and the D.B. Cooper mystery, a type of um, topographical formation, if I'm using that correctly. Maybe geographical would be a better answer. But the article top from newspapers.com is called Hacking Murders at Dog Bar Beach. A relatively calm and settled area and it was affected areas of placer in Nevada counties this week in the wake of the Grizzly Dog Bar Slayer. Hacking murders at Dog Bar Beach on Beach River, oh, sorry, Bear River, on July 12th 
residents of Eden Valley, Weimar, and Outer Meadow Vista, many of whom were terrorized at the thought of a maniac wielding a hand sickle, returned to everyday habits after Placer County Sheriff William A. Scott assured them that the slayer was out of the general area. We have good reason to believe that the suspect fled the region soon after the murders, he declared. In Nevada County, Sheriff Wayne Brown, in whose jurisdiction the murders occurred, agreed. Hacked to death in the late night assault were John Simmons, age 29, of Colfax, the father of seven, and, I mean, that does sound quite shocking, age 29 and a father of seven, but suppose anything's possible. Donna Fitzhugh, age 28, most recently of Ontario, Los Angeles County, and was still in critical condition at Sacramento Medical Center, and was Mrs. Fitzhugh's Heike McMahon to share the duties of zoning post. And I think the transcription of that sentence is a little bit off, so I'll jump ahead to the next one. Sheriffs of Sheriff's detectives of both counties were hopeful of an arrest sometime this week, and they were deluged after tips that had been released and a real composite sketch of the suspect had also been released, describing him as Caucasian, middle-aged, medium-build, husky-build, receding hairline, and wearing thick, horn-rimmed glasses. And when you do look at the composite sketch of the person, it has a little bit of a similar um, set of features compared to that of the Zodiac Killer, and definitely some similar features compared to that of somebody such as Arthur Lee Allen. But I think that the composite sketches that we see from cases in the 1960s and 70s are almost always just going to be very simple drawings of a white male wearing glasses. And Manny Grossman, using his undercurrents page, was actually somebody who was following along with the debate involving Gruzer and Gru Beeson. And he was talking a lot about the Son of Sam case. Manny's primary focus is the Son of Sam, but he does cover some other subjects as well. And he pointed out that the composite drawings in the Son of Sam case are all completely different. They do look like multiple perpetrators if you were to put them all side by side, but it could just be that they were inaccurate witness statements because witnesses can't always capture the way that somebody looks. A hundred percent. Sometimes they can get close, but not a hundred percent. And you also have other incidents, like, say, for example, the D.B. Cooper story, where you have people who are spending an enormous amount of time with D.B. Cooper, as opposed to the Robbins kids, who provided a lot of substance material for the composite sketches, and they barely saw the Zodiac at all. So I think that the Zodiac sketches are very unreliable. And this whole story about how the Grass Valley murders, what well, could have been the um, image in the paper that inspired somebody to think that it was Arthur Lee Allen. I mean, maybe if it is referring to the dog bar slayer and not the um, individual Sam Strange that was discussed in the first article. But I think I understand the point about how it's not even quite clear which Grass Valley murder is being directly referred to and referenced. Now, I would like to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about something that is connected to Ripper Wednesday. Every Wednesday I do a segment about Jack the Ripper here on the channel, and one of the Ripperologists that I was discussing was an individual named Bruce Robinson, who wrote a book called They All Love Jack, and he has a Jack the Ripper suspect named Michael Maybrick. And he has a video on YouTube where he just simply talks about serial killers, and I would like to look at how some of these statements involving serial killers are relevant to that of the Zodiac Killer. Number one, he says that one of the things that he learned in his research of the um, Ripper case is that there's even an FBI statement that says that serial killers are almost like people who are walking with God. They think that they are walking with God, or they're just they're on some type of elevated level of thinking with that of some type of being that is superior to humanity. And number one, I think that's a good observation, because we see this all the time in the Zodiac Killer mystery. For example, in the Zodiac Killer's 408 cipher, you have all of these different types of references where he's talking about how he wants to hunt man because man is the most dangerous animal of all, but if the Zodiac's the one who is hunting man, then he's really the one who's at the top of the food chain, or he's at the top of the hierarchy. And everything that the Zodiac Killer is doing is trying to show that he is superior to the people, the victims that he is going after. Now, what could the motivation for this be? A lot of it could be 
egoism, a lot of it could be just some type of rejection from society. It could also be just someone who's trying to fuel his own excitement. But most people expect that there was some type of self-serving motivation that the Zodiac Killer had to commit murders in 1968 and 69. The second point that was discussed by Bruce Robinson in his videos on serial killers walking with God were that they almost, um, almost have this connection to the economic situation of a country. And at first I was like, what? What are you talking about? And he said that as the economic situation of a country or a nation or a kingdom or anything of the sort begins to improve, the more serial killers you're going to have. And he estimated that there were, was it 300 or 500 serial killers that were active in America? I think he said 500 going off of memory. And both of those numbers, I think, are incorrect. Because as someone who does this true crime channel, I recently encountered a statistic that proposed that there could be around 100 active serial killers in America, which would be less than half of both of those estimates. But all of that aside, this idea that there is an increase in um, well, well-being, the quality of life, or just um, economic improvements, then serial killers are going to take place. And at first I thought, what a ridiculous connection. I mean, at first, even if that were true, who cares? And secondarily, is that even true? But then I began to think about it. And, I mean, he might have actually had a solid point. Sometimes you have to think about things. And as James and the Giant Peach told us, try looking at it a different way. And we have to remember that serial killers have a primary function and choice of murdering people. Murder has to be the primary objective, because another thing that was discussed in the same video was the thug e cult from India, and people like Thug Baram, who was referred to as a serial killer, perhaps the most prolific serial killer in history. 931 murders have been attributed to Thug Baram, although we aren't certain if he committed all the crimes. But I publicly stated on Black Box on my radio that I thought a crime or a criminal like that doesn't meet the definition of being a serial killer. Because number one, the thuggy were a cult, and they were also a cult that was heavily involved with banditry and stealing. And if it, anything is gang-related, stealing-related, drug-related, I think that, that that means that murder is not the primary objective. So as we would have improvements in economic situations in the nation or the kingdom or whatever type of state that people are living in, then we are going to have people who are going to be committing crimes for recreational reasons, committing murders for recreational reasons. And it's not only going to be committing murder to steal someone's food, committing murder so they can steal somebody's money. It's also going to be people who are simply committing murder for the sake of committing murder. And that is why I think a lot of people are learning about serial killers. And those observations are halfway Bruce Robinson's, halfway my own, all blended together. But I do highly recommend you check out his stuff, even though I ended up disagreeing with an enormous amount of his Jack the Ripper observations, but that was just me. And, I mean, at the same time, he came across as some guy who was very composed in his thinking. But the problem is, though, I have to always go back to Scott Adams, who wrote the books uh, Loser Think and Win Bigly, Persuasion in a World Where Facts Don't Matter, who simply stated that people will always tell you what they want. It's in their choice of words. And what I was hearing from this guy about why he chose to write a Jack the River book was he actually wanted to do a different true crime book, but he met with somebody, an old friend from the media world, and he um, was t talking to him about it, and he said, no, you need to go after the mother of all cases, which is Jack the Ripper, which means that already from the beginning, my interpretation of that was that he had to talk about a subject because it was popular, and ultimately, it seems like his Jack the Ripper book is borrowing from a bunch of other Jack the Ripper people and stitching the thing together with some philosophical insights. But that was my take on the subject, and I did an episode for the Anything Goes Friday segment dedicated to his suspect. It's called Jack the Ripper Suspect Michael Maybrick. And I also have a suspect video on Michael Maybrick's brother James, called just that Jack the Ripper Suspect James Maybrick. Both of them get accused of the crimes. But with the Zodiac Killer, absolutely, I think that Bruce Robinson's observations are relevant to the Zodiac, and I think that it's just an after-effect of the world that we live in, the societies that we live in, and, of course, the state that we live in. And the final thing that I would like to share with you for Black Box Online Radio this week 
is something that is a little bit even further out there. Far out, even a little, for me, a little bit. I encountered this clip on the YouTube shorts page, and it's from a YouTuber and Twitch live streamer named John Zerka, whom I had heard of before, but I just happened to encounter this little clip by chance, that was talking about his observations on serial killers, and I'm going to play that clip for you, and then we'll have a response and talk about its connections to the Zodiac Killer. This is the topic that gets you killed. It doesn't get you banned. Yeah, they do it in the military, but this level of perversion, it increases someone's capacity to kill someone. Like Ted Bundy, all the murderers, right? They're all bisexual. So the military scouts sexual deviancy. So if someone raped a cat or a dog, they go, okay, this guy, we're gonna bring them in the military. Look at his background, high in psychopathy. He's high in Machiavellianism. He's high in, you know, they look at these traits. Because they have no soul. They'll kill anyone if they can kill a dog and a cat. Yeah, they pull the trigger faster than you or I. And and you and I would be whistleblowers. Straight men are always like Malcolm X whistleblowers. They get killed. And one more time, those were the words of John Zerka. And my immediate response to that is probably something that you're going to be thinking about. And it doesn't relate to the Zodiac first. It relates to Ted Bundy, who was discussed in the clip. And this whole thing about how Ted Bundy was a bisexual serial killer. Well, was that even really true? I mean, Ted Bundy's nickname, which isn't used very frequently, was the Lady Killer. And Ted Bundy targeted women. He targeted women with a very specific appearance. And Ted Bundy's primary set of actions were heterosexual. And absolutely, absolutely, he had sexual motivations for targeting women. And with the Zodiac Killer, it's completely questionable if the Zodiac had any type of sexual benefit or sexual gratification that he got out of the crimes. I think he did. I think it's an example of a sexually motivated serial killer who didn't make physical contact with the bodies of the victims, but Ted Bundy had all types of physical contact with the victims. Sometimes Ted Bundy even had intercourse with the victims post-mortem. But as far as the thing about Ted Bundy being a bisexual serial killer, I think that that is just a pure misrepresentation. And I think the only possible way that there could be any type of justification for that type of thinking is if he's looking at it as, all right, this guy had some type of homosexual or bisexual proclivities or tendencies or some type of feminine side that he was wrestling with. Not even something about being a bisexual, just like a feminine side and his feminine side is involved with his plotting to commit murders against women. But I don't even know if that's the true intention of it. I just thought it was a very weird way of phrasing it. And to step back from these claims about how the military is brainwashing people with serial killer-like tendencies into committing the crimes. I'll respond to that in a second, but I just wanted to point out that, again, those observations about how someone has these bisexual tendencies and they're a driving force to commit serial murder are much more relevant to the Zodiac killer mystery rather than Ted Bundy, because when we look at Zodiac killer suspects, like some that have been discussed in this episode, Arthur Lee Allen and Richard Gajkowski, we can definitely see that those guys were both bisexual. Guy would go on to live out his years as a gay man, but he had heterosexual interactions in his younger years. In short, I think that Guy was a bisexual that preferred men. I think that Arthur Lee Allen was a bisexual that preferred males as well, although Arthur Lee Allen preferred much younger males. So I think that that just um, is something I don't even want to discuss any further for obvious reasons, because Arthur Lee Allen was a sex offender. And there's even on the Zodiac Killer suspect, William Joseph Grant, who also had issues with trying to hook up with men and truck stops and such when he was on the road. And he was married, and he's the subject of the book, The Zodiac Killer Called the Verup, also known as The Silence Badge. Robert Graysmith actually also talked about William Joseph Grant giving him the pseudonym Andrew Todd Walker. But with all of these examples, you have some type of theory where there was a serial killer named the Zodiac, calling himself the Zodiac. He calls himself Zodiac. And he was a homosexual who was trying to deny his homosexuality. He was a bisexual who was targeting couples for a reason because he wasn't able to live out the heterosexual life the way that they were, or that 
He was someone who would have been wrestling with his masculine side and his feminine side, and that this was some type of internal struggle that he dealt with. And it ended up coming out as someone trying to create a persona where he was going to blame the entirety of the Zodiac murders on said persona. And just, I mean, it's not even him who's committing the crimes, it's the Zodiac who's committing the murders. And it's sort of done in some type of um, struggle between the masculine and feminine sides, although that could be completely far out. Because even in the debate that I was talking about at the beginning, both of those guys were often playing the card of, hey, well, it's an unsolved case. We don't really know what happened. And in this episode, I've discussed several theories that people have, hypotheses and observations and commentary statements. But there's also the theory out there that there was indeed a woman who was involved with the plotting and planning of the process. There's more than one theory that involves a female. And for example, I mean, this could be something where you're actually dealing with someone who has a real feminine side. It's not just a bisexual man who is trying to deny his homosexuality. You would have a female participant. Number one, Ray Grant's Zodiac Killer Solved discusses that. That book uncovers a female involved in the planning process. Number two, we have Donald and Betty Harden are a team of suspects. I mean, there Donald Harden was the man who solved the 408 cipher, and his wife Betty Harden gets accused of being a participant in the planning of the Zodiac Killer murders. And the channel Zodiac Killer Identified talks a lot about them as Zodiac suspects, plus numerous people in the comment section think that Don and Betty Harden planned the Zodiac murders together. I absolutely disagree with all of them. And then you have um, even some talk about how a new suspect that is on my radar named L.D. Hill might have had a female accomplice that was involved with certain activities around his um, creation of the Zodiac persona. L.D. Hill is a suspect whom I discussed a lot. Last week he was brought forward by Thornton Daniel Jeffrey and Melissa Rose Tappa, and I really am not going to share anything more than that because I've agreed to only go through their material with their permission. But ultimately, I think that that is where we are going to going to have to leave it for now and simply just turn it over to you guys. And I would like to ask several challenge questions to you about the Zodiac Killer. And the first is, number one, do you believe that the Zodiac Killer was a homosexual? Number two, do you believe that there was any type of wrestling that this killer would have had trying to de deny his feminine side and it all just spills over in the creation of a zodiac persona and also the um the ultimate uh, challenge question that i won't want to share in this episode is what do you think about don cheney as a zodiac killer suspect and i said I, that i would respond to the issues about how the, the military is pulling people in and brainwashing them into becoming serial killers because they're dog rapists. We talk about the dog bar slayer and dog rapists in one episode. With some people, like this John Zerka guy whom you just heard the clip from, I am going to share the unpopular opinion that I, maybe it's a belief rather than an opinion, but I believe that people like that are just there for entertainment, that they are not meant to be taken seriously. And there is a little bit of fact in what they're saying but it is intentionally blended in with falsehoods and trolling. Yes, indeed, trolling. Just saying things to get a reaction out of people. And some people, such as this John Zerka guy, are very good at it. Because in another clip, he talks about how Alex Jones was a mentor of his for a lot of the things that he says, but he didn't want to talk about some of the conspiracy theories that Alex Jones wanted to discuss so what I noticed back in 2018, when Black Box Online Radio just had like six episodes, okay, it was more like 16, I began to notice that there was almost this desire for social commentary. And people simply wanted to discuss the social issues of life. And in the debate format, the podcast format, the talk radio format, the live stream format, and there's been an explosion of similar channels since. Supply and demand. And some people look at Alex Jones, and they're thinking, this guy had a lot of conspiracy theories about how the global elites are trying to destroy us. Why don't we try and incorporate that type of thinking 
into the world of social commentary to talk about social issues. Let's talk about masculinity and femininity. And granted, this whole thing about how the military is trying to brainwash um, people who have serial killer-like tendencies into becoming program killbots, I'm sure it gets your attention. But if the person doesn't genuinely believe what they're saying, then it's going into the entertainment category. Some people might be genuine frauds, but this guy, John Zerka, has openly admitted in other parts of YouTube that he is just trolling. He has said those exact words multiple times, but the fact of the matter is that's not going to change his audience. You don't listen to some guy like that because you want the truth. You listen to them because they are very loud and they say it in a particular uh, tone of voice. And the absolute final thing for this episode is going to be getting to your supporter shoutouts on buymeacoffee.com. First, we have one from Batman66. Batman66, thank you so much for your regular and consistent support. You are amazing, especially for all the ideas that you have shared for Black Box Online Radio. And the next one comes to us from Josh. And it says, Hey Ned, hope you are doing well. I've been a loyal fan for nearly four years now, and I always look forward to the new BBOR episodes. I work with my dad, and lately the job has been pretty boring and physically taxing, but I've been throwing on some of your content for us to listen to, and it's really made the days go by much easier. I wanted to say thank you for the much-needed entertainment, especially lately, but as well as the near four years I've been listening. Ah, uh, well, Josh, I mean, thank you so much for listening back into the days of the black box, when there really was just a black box on the screen, and the pink bubbles were going around, and that was the only movement that was there. And YouTube has changed so much, I don't think anyone would ever find any value in a content in a channel like that, even though sometimes people turn tune into the old black box episodes. But now, I mean, we're just in a different world, and it is an industry in itself. But thank you so much to li for listening to this episode, everybody. And anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there was always blackboxnet88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Goodbye.